Good morning, New Life Alliance Church. Good morning. Are you new today? Do you have a life? Yes. It's called New Life Alliance Church. Well, we continue our uh, sermon series on the book of Nehemiah. Yes, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. 27 in the New Testament. And today is about what do we do after we say Amen here and we go home. This is what the message is all about. But let me start with this, because one time... I remember this, even still now, I remember that I had my alarm, radio alarm before. Like now I use my phone, but at one point I was using this radio alarm. And I put it on the closest, before I went to bed, I put it on the closest radio station, FM. And I left it there. I didn't know what station it was. And so in the morning, I was, you know, when you are like, uh, you have slept well and uh, you, you kind of, what is going on? Like you hear something? Because I heard this woman shouting from the radio. It goes like, ra, 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 roma, roma, ma. No, seriously, that was like the shout of like, it's like, you know, when you're like sleeping and you just like, ra, 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 ra. And then I figured out it was my, my uh, radio alarm. I said, what is going on? <laughs> you guys know what's up? <laughs> no, it wasn't my wife. <laughs> so the, the message today is like, what do you listen to? What songs do you listen after we sing all these uh, nice songs? Like when we go home from the church, what do you do? So it's like really a, a lifestyle, a behavior of a, of a follower of Jesus. Like one time, I, I don't know how true this story, but I read this story about a store manager. And so it must, must have been a, a man, because it's manager. If it was a woman, it would have been a wool manager, but this manager, he overheard a conversation of one of his staff, you know, the clerk. The conversation with the customer went like this. Yeah, ma'am, we, we haven't had for a while, you know, in fact, we haven't had for weeks, and I don't think we'll be getting anytime soon. And this manager, when he heard that, he was like, I wait, because uh, you shouldn't be saying, you know, in his mind, you shouldn't be saying we don't have it. So he went to the customer before the customer left. He goes, ma'am, that's not true. We have it. We have placed the order a week ago and it's coming. And then when the customer left, he pulled the, uh, the credit and goes, you know, you should never say to the customer, we, ne we don't have it. If we don't have it, you say we have placed an order and it's coming. Now, what was the customer want? He goes, rain. <laughs> we haven't had rain. It's, uh, you know, weeks now. I don't think we'll have rain for a while. <laughs> have you made promises that you're not able to keep? In Vancouver, I can promise you rain. <laughs> but the whole idea of this message is that if you look at the book of Nehemiah chapter 8 and 9, they read the Word of God and they understood what God requires or desires from God's people. And so after that, the expectation, then they made a vow in chapter 10. These vows found in chapter 10 are also vows or promises that every Christian need to make serious today. And uh, this is really about the vow we make today, the commitment we make today to live a life after we say amen. Because commitment, when you commit to something, you become what you are committed to. That's just the whole idea. 
And uh, King Solomon reminded us, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. So if we make a promise, vow is a promise, we need to fulfill it because God wants us to follow through with our promises. So if you have your Bible on Nehemiah chapter 10, we'll go through it as we go along. But uh, I'm not going to read it verse by verse. We'll just pick on uh, certain verses. But the first vow that they made, and that we need to commit today as well, is the vow, commit to the vow of sacred living. Sacred living. What is sacred living? Sacred living is holy living. And in the book of Nehemiah, sacred living means two things. Number one is uh, in verse 28, verse 8, it says, uh, it's submis uh, 29 is submission to the word. Because it says, all these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. So when we make sacred commitment, uh, sacred living, the promise, it means submission to the word. And verse before that is separation from the world because it says in verse 28 that they live separately among the people who are not uh, uh, followers of God. So separation from the world, submission to the word is what it takes to have sacred living. Now let me explain what that means because separation from the world could mean different things but here's what it means from a Christian perspective. When you separate yourself from the world, it's not isolation. Isolation is when you separate yourself, live in the farm with your group of people and uh, make your own colony, ants colony, and you isolate yourself. No phone, no TV. Uh, that's isolation. That's not what it means by separation. Also, separation doesn't mean insulation, you know, where you protect yourself so your kids shouldn't be watching movies, you shouldn't be uh, listening to ra-ra-ra-ra-ra, uh, all that stuff, because these are bad for them. They, you insulate your family. That's not what it means either by separation. Separation simply means that you live a life that people can know you are different. You are separate from the rest. So for example, the rest would be uh, on a disco on Friday night, but you are in a house church. Saturday, you are always partying, uh, your friends are partying, but on a Saturday you are in a Bible study. So people can know you are different. That's what it means, separation. So submission to the Word is also not a declaration that we will not sin anymore. When we say, I submit to the word of God and I promise with all my heart. It doesn't mean that we, became, we become saints and we will never sin. It is simply means that we have the word of God. We have the word of God as our guide for our holy and sacred living. In other words, we will not check what is popular in this culture or politically correct to help us to uh, know what is right and wrong. Right and wrong is written from the Word of God. That's what it means, submission to the Word. So in other words, popular culture, you know, if you want to know what is popular today, you listen to the top 100 in the music chart. And if you look at the top 100, listen to some of the uh, some of the songs there. The title goes like this. There are some there that says money. The other one is God is a woman. <laughs> Happier. These are the songs, the song titles in the top 100. I am a mess. I like it. 
All this stuff. So, you know, in other words, if you place, the problem with placing our hope and our trust in popular culture, what is popular, is that the next time those are replaced by something else. So in other words, it's not a fixed and firm foundation. And that's why it's good to place our trust and faith in God because God says, I never change. I am the same who said, I forgive you. If He doesn't change, He doesn't say, you know what, all of a stop. All of a sudden, He says, you know what, you've done something that I didn't expect, so I will not forgive you this time. It's not like He's a changing God. So when you place, when I place my faith in popular culture, I can't do that because it's, it's a shifting sand. And there's nothing in lyrics for me like ra 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 ra, ga 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 ga, roma roma ma. There's nothing in there for me. And so I can't put my faith in that. So that's what sacred living is. Submission to the Word of God as the guide of right and wrong and separation from the world. Like, not insulation, not isolation, but just different. Just different. <laughs> That's one of the things we need to commit today before we leave church. And so here's the second one. Commit to the vow of sacred relationships. Now, let's read uh, verse 30. It says, We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. So the idea today uh, is because we don't have arranged marriage now, right? So the, uh, before they have arranged marriage. But the idea today, even just the idea that you choose the spouse of your children based on religious convictions, those are politically incorrect today. You know, because there's such a thing as freedom, all that stuff. Uh, and there's such a thing as tolerance, and acceptance. But the, board, the Bible, the Word of God, gave us so much examples of what it means and what happened and the tragedy of people who uh, engage in different uh, religious beliefs and they marry different uh, women with different beliefs. For example, Samson and Delilah. You, you, what happened to him, right? And uh, also, Solomon and his foreign wives. In fact, the problem of the exile, you know, is the Israelites were exiled for 70 years. It was rooted in their marrying, you know, intermarriages. Because then the uh, foreign women had the influence and all that stuff. Because women are powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. They are not the head. <laughs> but they are the neck that turns the heads out anyway. So that's, that's where the influence, you know, some, someone says that leadership is influence. Power is influence. So if you have influence, you have leadership, you have power. And so, that's why in the Word of God, He reminds us, make sure that your spouse have the same faith, because then how can, this is what the Bible says, you know, the Bible is referring to, if you marry someone with, with, uh, with a different belief than you, it's like having, it's hard to picture for those who are new, uh, or doesn't know what farming is, but you know what a, uh, a carabao is with, sometimes they use two carabaos or two cows. And can you imagine one cow is like a full cow and the other one is actually a mule? They're not matching in their work together. So it's really hard to work out and that's what the picture of the Bible of marrying with different beliefs. In fact, he goes like this, this is Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? The vow, in other words, the vow of sacred relationship means that married to an unbeliever 
is seen as an act of disobedience based on this verse. And in fact, you can go deeper as as an act of disloyalty to Christ, to the Word of God. So it's very important. Now it doesn't mean that if you make that mistake, that God will not forgive you. He will. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, marriages like that. But it doesn't guarantee, because I've also seen a lot of marriages that even now are totally uh, destroyed, in confusion. Their kids, when they grow up, they don't know where to go. Which church do I go? This one? My mom's church? My dad's church? There, there is really a, it creates a lot of mess. So it, it helps if we follow. So even now, my advice as we have this in our couples retreat, is to pray for your children now. So pray for the future spouse. So in our spouse with uh, marriage retreat or couples retreat, we talk about the three G's that you can pray for your children. Number one is that your child, your children marry someone who is godly. That's the first G. The second one, that your uh, Children will marry a spouse, or God is preparing a spouse, not only godly, but generous. That's the second G. And then the third one is that he's or, you know, good looking. That's, that's the other G. <laughs> and you know what, seriously, that's what I pray for my kids. Uh, so, and God answered our prayers. Amen. Yes. <laughs> so that is very important. You know, they say, I don't know if you've heard this, they say that a fish has a six-second memory. That's why they get hooked all the time. <laughs> and so, but you are not a fish. I am not a fish. So we can learn from our mistakes or the mistakes of others and avoid past destructive relationships. So this is one of the things we need to commit today. Here's the third one. Commit to the vow of Sabbath rest. This is very important. In 31, it says, When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Every seventh year, we will forgo working the land and will cancel all debts. Oh, I wish my, my debts are canceled every seven years. <laughs> but uh, this is a vow of keeping our Sabbath rest. Now, let me explain what that Sabbath is. Because people think that's Saturday. That's not what it means. The word Sabbath is from the original uh, Hebrew word Shabbat. Uh, it means in Messiah, we have a word actually like Shabbat. <laughs> we have that, like, but that's not what it means. Shabbat, it means rest. It doesn't mean Saturday. It doesn't mean anything else. It just means rest. So the vow of Sabbath, the rest, you know, in the uh, New Testament, the people... Uh, especially the Pharisees, they made it into a burden for them. You know, the, every Sabbath you shouldn't be moving your hand to do something because that's work. You know, don't feed your animal because that's work. They made it into a burden. But Jesus actually is saying to us, He says this in Mark 2.27, that it's for us. It says, then He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, Sabbath was created for us. And so if you look at the Bible, it means two things. Sabbath means two things. It means restoration, and it also means recreation. Now physically, every seventh day we need some, you know, rest to be able to be effective. And companies, uh, corporations have found out that people who work so hard, working overtime, they are less likely to be 100% in their work. So if you uh, read the news, they even had, in fact, they recognized the, uh, the Sabbath rest. And some companies, corporations, even went the extra mile. You know, if one person, if one day can help a person recover fully so that he is or she is 100% at work, 
then there's a company in New Zealand that says, we, we will try this eight hours a day for four days and you get paid full. So they tried it, it's an insurance company, and in fact, after weeks of trial, they said, we will embrace this because the result is pretty good. So now, uh, I wanna work for that company <laughs> in New Zealand. Four days of eight hour a day, but paid as if you work five days. So they find value. So even, it's not original from them. It's like already in the Bible. Physically, we need to rest. Sabbath is where you find rest. That's the purpose of Sabbath. Matthew 18, 28, Jesus says this. Come to me, all, we, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Maybe some of us can use that. I use the word us because I was reflecting this week. I said, Lord, I asked. Seriously, the, the last few days I've asked God for forgiveness. Because I have not really taken this seriously in my life. And I said, God, I need, I need to take this seriously. Because the definition of rest go like this. It's in dictionary. Peace. Freedom from trouble and anxiety and having tranquility <clears throat> with the uh, blue ocean, white sand. Can you use any of that? That's what rest is. So it's actually physical rest, restoration. The other one is the soul rest, the recreation. It's a time when you begin to, in a spiritual rebooting. So not only Sabbath rest is for physical, it's also for your soul. It's for my soul. Rebooting. Okay, let me show you what, in computer, when your computer is slow and it's like hanging, and worse, it crashes. It's because there's so many things in the background. Some of the things in the background you can see even if you toggle, you know, shift out or whatever in, in uh, Mac, it's like command and tab or whatever. Whatever it is, you can see all those, but when you have a computer, there are some things that are open that you can't even see. You know, it uses uh, a lot of your memory. Uh, it's resident in there, but the only way to get rid of that, like a virus can do that too, the only way to get rid of that is to turn off your computer for a few seconds and then turn it back on. That's what it means to have this rebooting, this spiritual rebooting and usually what fills your life what fills your moment when you are in your Sabbath rest prayer conversations with God and reading the scripture or journaling so that's what it means to rest now a lot of things I realized that it's so hard to rest because it's resting is a trust issue because if I don't trust God I can't finish this, Lord, if I, if I don't do this today, if I do this tomorrow, I can't finish this. So, I gotta do it today. Amen. It's a trust issue. And I notice that for myself. Also, if you are worried that you cannot pay for your bills because you have to have one day off, it's a trust issue. Unless you have no choice, really, that the company really demands that you work just remind them of the company in uh, New Zealand. <laughs> but that's what it means. And Psalm 127 verse 2, it says here, It is useless for you to work. I wish that's the end of the verse. <laughs> <laughs> it is useless for you to work. Oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, <laughs> to work so hard from early morning until late at night anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Wow. Thank you, Lord. So the Sabbath allows us for physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional rebooting and refocusing. Here's the uh, fourth one. 
Commit to the vow of sacred responsibilities. What are these sacred responsibilities? It will lay out in verse 32. You can read through that. And verse 35. It's actually about our responsibility to the church. To the body of Christ. It says in verse 32, it says, We assume the responsibility for, and it's talking about the, uh, the work that needs to be done in the church, the financial thing that needs to be taken care of in the church. And in verse 35 it says, We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. Well, wow. every fruit tree, the first fruits we give to the Lord. Sorry, Lord, I missed to do that on my uh, fourth tree at the back. <laughs> Of my fig tree. And then it says, We will not neglect the house of our Lord. Now let me explain what a first fruit is, okay? The first fruit is in an agrarian uh, nation, the first fruit is basically to make sure that the, uh, the tithe or the 10% of that, first, of that uh, fruit or the vegetables are allocated. And uh, we did this growing up, we didn't have any, any cash. We had vegetables, so you know, we give a portion of that to the church. Whatever they do with that, that's up to them. You know, they can eat it and sell it. But that's what we did growing up. And also with animals, they do the same thing. So basically, that's the idea of uh, when you are a farmer. But it's easier now, right? Because you get the pay stuff. And you know how to calculate easily. Oh, I get that, 10% of that. But that's what they were doing. Because they were farmers. They were, uh, you know, first fruit and birthing animals and herds. All that stuff, they understand what belongs to the Lord. Basically, when you give forth uh, the first fruits, it means two things. First fruits, it means two things. It means that you realize that what is mine is no longer mine. You know what they say, what, what is yours is mine. What is mine is <laughs> mine. But when you understand that God gives you everything, the law of the first fruits means what is mine is no longer mine. And the other one is that you can't reap what you are not sowing. That's what it means. And so we have this option this morning. We either believe that God will provide and we do His promise of being faithful to Him and to His church in our giving, or we decide that our way is better and that we take care of our needs first and our desires and then whatever is left over, we give to God. And so a lot of us, we need to evaluate our financial uh, situation but we also need to evaluate what it means for Jesus to be the Alpha and the Omega meaning the beginning and the end what it means for Jesus to be the King and the Lord of our lives including our finances and so this is what our commitment today four things commit to the sacred living Sacred relationships, sacred rest, and sacred responsibility. In summary, let me say this. A doctor can cheat on his wife and still be a good surgeon. You agree with that? A lawyer can cheat and still be a good practicing lawyer. Do you agree with that? A salesperson can cheat on his income tax and still be a good salesperson. Do you agree with that? A politician can take bribes and still win a seat in the Senate. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Can. Not will, can. But we cannot do all these things as Christians and continue to enjoy the blessing of the Lord. That's the whole idea. So let's make a vow today, a commitment to do 
the sacred thing in our lives. Living relationships, rest, and responsibilities. That is our commitment today. After we say amen, what are we going to do? That's what we're going to do. A commitment to all these four sacred things. Let's pray together.